Welcome to The Label, the stories, rumors, and legends of Tooth & Nail Records. This week's episode, uh, I'm going to have to warn you, is a little bit heavy. It's a little bit different in that regard. Uh, And I'll have to tell you something else. It was a freaking beast to make. Like, really a problem. We started this episode months ago with the idea of exploring mental illness and depression and suicide because it's actually very common in the music industry and, and you know people I know. I was looking through the roster of Solid State and Tooth and Nail artists over the years and I was just every picture I would look at it, it would come in my head like oh yeah this guy in that band this guy in that band deals with this and pretty, I, I think the statistics are pretty close to one in five people deal with mental illness and that bears out because almost every band I know has somebody that deals with it. And on top of that, there's been two major suicides in the music industry since we started this episode, and that's Chester Bennington and Chris Cornell, obviously. And this is terrible news that made this episode all the more complicated or perhaps important to complete. So we we press on, and uh, as I said, the problem is we just couldn't get anybody to talk about it. That's that's just really the bottom line, is, is people are pretty comfortable... Uh, memorializing people who are gone. But short of that, people seem to kind of just not want to deal with it. Maybe it's scary or maybe it's dangerous or they don't want to say the wrong thing. And, and I totally understand that. And as we sat down to make the episode, we, we gathered a bunch of hours of interviews and we're contacting people and trying to track down a few specific stories we wanted to tell. Uh, but uh, we hit roadblock after roadblock and we've been able to get some amazing footage and some great inside information and controversies through the course of doing this podcast, but this one is just totally different. We'd have these promising conversations, and they would go bizarrely cold as soon as things began to feel too real or, or, or get close. So Melanie, the other producer of this podcast, and I were kind of left scratching our heads at how to make sense of the complexities of it and, and figure out this conversation, but more importantly, how are we going to complete the episode? So we did. Uh, we were able to find some people willing to talk about some stuff, but you just have to know that this topic is is much bigger and touches almost every band. The good news being that there's tons of artists and musicians on Tooth & Nail that have been for years and years talking about it through the songs and through the music. And that actually does seem to work. It seems to help people, and it seems to be totally possible. So uh, we know it's an important topic to talk about this, and we also had to acknowledge that given the complicated nature of this. Uh, We don't want to add more noise to an already confusing conversation. So I do hope that you'll find this episode both helpful and informative. So here's Melanie. She's going to guide us through the episode. As we all know, suicide and depression are taboo topics, but I hope we can all see that not talking about them is causing more harm than good. According to the National Network of Depression Centers, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in America among people between the ages 15 to 44. And the numbers seem to be climbing as suicide is being unintentionally glorified by those who mourn the loss of people like Kurt Cobain or Chris Cornell, because we don't seem to understand how to honor those we lose to suicide while acknowledging the fact that the person we lost is the one who took themselves away from us in the first place. See what I mean? It's already getting messy. And in the world of artists and musicians, it's no easier to navigate these murky waters. And oddly enough, it gets even more confusing when you throw in the element of faith. Tooth & Nail Records has its own tragic history with the loss of Tim Jordan from All American Rejects and Joan Zetta, as well as John Bunch from Sunsfield and Further Seems Forever, and also the attempted suicide of Rob Schweitzer from May. Later on in this episode, we're going to hear Rob's take on his attempted suicide, as well as talk to Aaron Lunsford about his friendship with Tim Jordan and how Tim's suicide has impacted those closest to him. Toby, Aaron, and Matt got in the studio and talked about some of the varying factors that impact the mental health of Christians in and around the Christian music scene. Here's some of that conversation. What are the what is the background, or as you guys have seen it and done in the investigation of it, what are the things that you think contribute to this fertile ground of mental illness and touring musicians? Well, I think after doing all the interviews, three things kind of just stand out. One is that we're talking about tooth and nail, and they tooth and nail has always been associated with Christianity, and Christianity is notorious for not addressing mental health problems. Hmm. Uh, it, it sweep it under the rug. Don't talk about it. From my own experience, my, my dad struggles with depression, and we have never spoken of it. And that's because we, of Christianity, you think? He's he's a pastor's kid. It is a weakness to my to my father. Any kind of mental illness is something that you are just being weak or lazy or not overcoming, and he doesn't understand that he actually needs some help. He needs other people. He might need medication. All of these things, and it was because he felt so uh, constricted, I guess, from Christianity that don't talk about it. Give it to the Lord. Pray it away. 
mm -hmm. and it'll be okay. You're just sad. You're not depressed. I'm Bruce with Living Sacrifice, and I'm talking about the song Despair off of our eighth album, Ghost Thief. The song comes from a fairly desperate, dark time, dark place. It directly references um, my feelings and depression I had during my divorce. But just kind of like when you feel like, well, I've done all of the right things, but it's just not enough, you know? The chorus, you know, give unto me your despair, your sorrow, is, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the answer to all of those things. I love how music can transcend people where they are, no matter who they are and whatever situation they're in. If it, if it impacts them, it impacts them, and that's, that's awesome. To get an even broader perspective of how Christians are not really helping matters much, Matt reached out to a former Tooth & Nail employee, Micah Dean Johnson. My name is Micah Dean Johnson. I started interning at Tooth & Nail in 2007. I believe I officially got hired in 2008. Micah eventually became an A&R guy at Tooth & Nail, and we wanted to get his perspective of how struggling with depression while being a believer in a community of Christians wasn't really as helpful as one might think. This sucks to say, but kind of the the church I grew up in and the people I grew up around me, uh, depression seemed like a, a thing that didn't really exist and that it's not something people have and that it's only Satan bringing you down and that you can't actually have depression, but rather you're, you're not living strong enough for God and, and you know, s Satan's kicking your ass basically. I think everybody thinks if you admit this, that you have mental illness, that it somehow diminishes Jesus's strength or power or redemptive qualities that he has, mm -hmm. his redemptive characteristics. And so don't say anything because you'll get better. Or it might even be along the lines of when we see this in bands a lot is you got to protect your witness, right? So you have to right. look good. The point is to look good so that you speak well about Jesus. That's pretty rampant in Christianity to some, which is a, a great notion, but taken too far, it's certainly damaging we've seen in, in many spheres. Yeah. And this is, I guess, one of them. For tooth and nail bands especially, or particularly, Christianity was a force that was causing them to be a little bit hidden, right? Well, as you guys know, it, it's really easy to be hidden even within your own band. It's hard to talk to somebody about uh, that, that they're lazy or that they smell bad or that they, you don't like their stage presence when you're sleeping beside them and riding beside them for hours and hours a day. You're only on stage for about an hour a day. The other 23 hours, you're with these people. And so I can even remember, even within our own band, Emery, our bass player, Joel, was really going through some stuff that I think now I would I would say was probably mental health issues but we just saw it as him being frustrating yeah. we were frustrated or with threatening him. We, and, to what we were doing exactly even worse. And, yeah and we didn't talk about it mm -hmm. we couldn't talk about it all it led to was eventually we never really discussed all the things that were going on and we just let Joel go mm -hmm. and so that is so with all the stress from just Christianity and being hidden it even gets even more stress when it, there, there's even more stress that follows when you're in a band, you've started a business, mm -hmm. and you do, you can't even talk to your best friends because it might be detrimental to your friendship and your job and your new identity as a band dude. Yeah, it creates a culture where you can't, you're afraid to talk about what you're going through because you, you don't want to say no to the next tour. Like you're trying to keep the ship moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And because there's that pressure to, you look at every other band around you, everybody's touring as much as possible. Um, it's uh, it's a competition in a mm -hmm. way. You have so to tour. You, you don't want to miss out. Like, yeah, what are you going to say if if Under Oath or whoever asks you to go on tour, you can't say, no, I'm not feeling good. But yeah. that that kind of pressure, though, that just kind of builds up. And it might be better if, if you were able to at least say, hey, I don't feel good, I don't want to do this tour, that could open up a conversation. Yeah. Maybe you'd still do the tour, but you, just to not talk about it at all yeah. is kind of crazy. So. But, it, but what would happen in that situation, and we've been guilty of this, it would have been like if one band member came and said, hey, I'm feeling crazy or burnt out or anxious about this, I, 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 let's just not do the next tour. 
I mean, the yeah. reaction from the rest of the band would just inevitably, are you crazy? You got to man mm-hmm. up, but we got to do this, whatever. Or, or, you know, there's just no way you would turn something down when you're in the middle of that new opportunity and things are fresh and, and stuff like that. And, it, you know, I, I can recognize it a lot more in hindsight now that it's a, a toxic way of, of thinking, at least. But it, it, if nothing else, it clearly is common. Here's Chris Dudley from Under Oath talking about uh, how they didn't really talk about stuff we kind of felt like we were just like along for this ride and you know we were going through this through these motions of you know just being on the road playing shows writing and it, but in a lot of ways as as friends and as people we had we had really grown apart just because you know even though we were just in a metal tube traveling the country for 10 months a year we just weren't really communicating yo what's up this is spencer from under oath I'd probably say the song we get the most is a song called To Whom It May Concern off the Find the Great Line. Um, A song that I wrote basically to myself, about myself, speaking about how it's not the end of the road. There's always a light, even in the darkest of times in your life, to to hold on and to not take the easy way out. Yeah, I I meet a ton of people that express how that song has helped or just the album in general. Music, uh, it makes you feel like you're not alone. You know, I think... That's the power of music, man. That's the power of a song. So I reached out to a friend of mine, Rob Schweitzer from the band May, and he and I discussed his suicide attempt, which was back in 2013. Now, I'll give you the skinny on who Rob is just to catch you up, just to give you a little context. Rob is the short, bald, passionate, charismatic keyboard player from May. He's an incredible musician. He is super fun to be around. He is somebody that, for the limited time I've spent around him on tour and stuff like that, would have never guessed actually had problems this deep or could ever attempt suicide. And I'm so glad that he is here. I am so glad that he's somebody that I get to talk to now. And uh, I just wanted to, when we were doing this episode, just wanted to kind of call him and pick his brain. He came on the Bad Christian Podcast once and had told us his story. And in doing this episode, I just thought, man, is there, is, maybe I could talk to him about it and, and gain some kind of insight. So I will warn you that this conversation does have some pretty graphic details and some really heavy content. So if you think this could be triggering to you at all or cause you any kind of problems, then I would recommend skipping ahead for the next few minutes. The stars they seemed to paint the most elaborate scene today. How could we know that song this show we learned so much about ourselves from Toledo to Tokyo the words were scribed on every page and now there's books up on our shelves did you know how you would move us did you When the light first came upon us and we saw the everglow and the moment's magic swept us away. And a young man's dream was almost seen so plain. Well, Rob, you're, uh, you're, you're my hero and this podcast hero for doing this interview. For, first of all, I, your bravery to speak on the topic, I really appreciate. So let's, I know we did it on the Bad Christian Podcast some, but could you give uh, like the Cliff's Notes version of your suicide attempt, to, the leading up to it and, and what it, the details were of it? In, in 20, February 2013 is when is when things kind of went awry for me. I didn't realize that things had escalated in my, my mental health or de-escalated in my mental health until I got to this particular place of feeling that I wasn't really going anywhere with any sort of goal, even though I had been back with my former band, May, for a couple of reunion shows. And we had just played some three sold-out shows in our local hometown, which was which was great. 
But it just goes to show that, that that's not an indication. Like, the good times are not an indication of how you're doing mentally. Mm-hmm. And in February, I got into an argument with my then girlfriend, and then, um, you know, alcohol was involved. I, I, was, I was drinking a lot back then, and then I drank um, to the point where uh, I just um, felt overwhelmingly unable to, um, to cope with anything. So mm-hmm. I took up uh, the, the bottle of liquor and um, I, grabbed a, I, grabbed an, uh, I grabbed a knife and, uh, and just went up into the, into, um, you know, into the bathroom, locked myself in and uh, um, you know, tried to do what, it, what I, I couldn't do. I, I was not successful in doing. Mm-hmm. Um, then the whole thing happened. Ambulance came because my girlfriend found me passed out in the, uh, in the bathroom. Uh, emergency, police. Mm-hmm. It was just a dramatic. I never thought I would ever be at a place like that in all of my life. And then I get carted off into uh, this behavioral medical ward. Well, emergency room first for a few hours. And then I got carted off into the behavioral medical center of the hospital and told that I had a temporary uh, detention order that was issued for me Mm -hmm. by the police department because that's just protocol. You know, you try to kill yourself, they're going to keep you in a mental ward for, you know, a couple days until you get a hearing. So that's where I was. I was in a psych ward for two days. The the effect that's going on is there's some people willing to talk about their own stuff and somewhat in a vague way a little bit. But when the people that have been affected by other people, they are terrified to talk about other people. So let's say somebody that knew somebody who committed suicide and it affected their life, they don't want to talk about it. The only thing that people seem to be okay doing is just memorializing somebody that's gone. Like, everybody's comfortable with that because it's safe, obviously. I'm not saying it's bad Mm -hmm. to do that, but with Chester Bennington or Chris Cornell, everybody is comfortable talking at length about how great they were. But anything short of that that would sound like criticism or confusion or it affected me in a bad way, everybody gets that's what everybody gets really scared of. It seems like well, it's it's arm's length, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's you're safest when you're when you're talking about third person. You, I mean, you hit on it right there. And and it seems like there's a counterproductive element to that in that if people are afraid to talk about it, mainly when it's going on. And for instance, in Christianity, you see that really bad. Like people are fine with talking about the problems they used to have before, but nobody ever wants to talk about the problems that are now. So as somebody that's had mental illness and suicide attempts and stuff like that, what does, what does that feel like in the moment where people don't, did you ever feel that way? Like you were willing to talk about your own stuff, but other people were not. Um, yeah, it's like I said, it's a, it's a very, it's a private issue. A very intimate issue and one that no one really wants to to be uh, known for being weak. And that's mm-hmm. what it's looked at as, you know, primarily. I think no matter how positive people try to spin it, it's 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 looked at as a weakness. Mental health, depression, um, anytime that you had a suicidal ideation, it's like, why were you so weak? And um, I guess in the the uh, the Christian hemisphere, especially, right? If you mm-hmm. are truly a believer in God and have God in your life, then why are you suffering? You know, I mean, we all we all talk about like we're, we're we're still we're still in this in this world, so there's going to be some suffering. But at the same time, there's the diametrical opposite where we're like, well, we're invincible. We have God dwelling in us and around us, and so we're we're fine. Right. And um, that still seems like not wanting to admit weakness being the thing going on there. No, and it's not. And I think I think that's an important thing. I think there's strength in admitting your weakness because then you're able to uh, proceed in getting the help that you need to get. I think it's it's, it's a trap. Uh, and a tragedy that uh, we are made to feel guilty about being weak, and it's not a it's not a weakness. It's a mental health issue, and mm-hmm. it's something that needs to be addressed, and the appropriate help needs to be gotten for those who are who are going through it. You know, what's flooring about this, I imagine, to many people is May is successful. May's a right. really big band. They want he Rob's a guy who had a lot of musical talent, had a lot of ambition joined a band, worked hard for years, was really successful, and he still had, still these pro- got married, had money, success, everything, and still feels the same way, still wound up at this point. That's, that's hard to understand. I mean, the only way I can put that into context is say it always, it never made a lick of sense to me when Kurt Cobain killed himself because I thought, 
well, that he has the best life you could ever want. He's in the best band that there ever was, and he got everything he wanted. And so that I just I, I was just a teenager at the time. I was 14 years old when Kurt Cobain killed himself, but I, I couldn't I couldn't make sense of it. I had no experience with the world or anything, but I just on its surface, I had no idea why the person that I wanted to be most like wasn't happy when he had everything you could want, from my view. I think oftentimes that is the one of the key factors that causes the depression and anxiety and pressure is that you should be happy. You do have everything. I've been asked so many times in my life, hey, what's it like to live the dream being in a band? And that totally makes me feel guilty for ever complaining about it or feeling bad about it or you know expressing that I'm going through some tough stuff. So is it courage or strength? And is that what I'm waiting for? If I could just kill myself, would it also kill the remorse? I wanted so badly to catch a break, but I'm only breaking down. I'm still here and standing, but if it's up to me, I don't think. I'll be hanging around. The idea for the song I Never Got to See the West Coast was basically after having played literally hundreds and hundreds of shows uh, throughout the years, it started happening to where almost every show somebody would come up and say, your music means so much to me and this song got me through it. Your lyrics and your music helped me not want to commit suicide and helped me want to be here tomorrow and the next day and the next day. There is something pretty powerful about music. And I wrote, I never got to see the West Coast, about those feelings that you aren't alone. If these people are willing to come up to me and tell me that they had contemplated taking their own life, how could I not use the art and write a song specifically about that when all these other songs that I wrote not about suicide meant so much to them? How could I not just write a song that was specifically for these people? I just want them to know they're not alone. Here's Micah again sharing his perspective of how, quote, having it all really doesn't matter when you have depression. When I was at Tooth and Nail, it was like, at that time, it was like my dream job. And I lived in like my dream house with like my friends and stuff. And I would still deal with that depression. And I think that's when I really realized how real it was, is that like I have everything I've ever wanted as like a 25-year-old kid. And I still am just the most depressed, the sadness uh, that's happening right now, even though everything else is like tip-top financially. You know, even having my dream job at the time, that's kind of how that's that's when I realized how serious it was, mm-hmm. is that I, I could be the, the richest person in the world, but still dealing with this. It's it's it, it sucks. I bet that resonates for Chester Bennington and Chris Cornell, then like that you identify with them and that like obviously they most people thought they had it all. Yeah, it's it's really severe. And I, I feel like it's passed off pretty easily when musicians say it because. A lot of people are like, ah, oh, you're just trying to sell more records. You you really do have everything in the world. And, uh, yeah, it's it, it's so much more deeper than that. Aaron, you have a pretty upfront, close, and personal thing if you're willing to talk about it here on the podcast. You've got some real front-line experience with this. Yeah, yeah, it got pretty bad there about 12 years ago now, I mm-hmm. think. Um, so there's this guy, Tim Jordan, who a lot of people have heard of. But me and Tim were, uh, I guess you'd say we were best friends. We were both from Arkansas, knew each other from the local scene there. Anyway, Tim, long story short, Tim had a, uh, he had a pretty cool career in music, and he ended up playing in the All-American Rejects. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's when like we met a, Tim on Warp Tour. He was on Warp Tour in 2005 when we were, Yeah, and he was playing he was, with the All-American Rejects at the time. Yeah, he mm-hmm. was their auxiliary um you know, guitarist and keyboard and tambourine backup vocals and stuff like that. Um, but after he uh, quit playing with them, he joined Joan Zetta, and he was helping uh, Joan Zetta write their debut record, uh, Popularity. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, Tim had a... I, I mean, he'd been struggling with depression and all that stuff for ever since I'd known him. But uh, yeah, two th- December 2005, uh, he, you know, killed himself. And... Uh, he was in Jones Ed at the time. Yeah, yeah, he was in Jones Ed. So, so that had a, a big effect on the immediate world we're talking about to yeah. now. 
So, Aaron, I, you know, I, I know this is hard for you to even talk about, and I appreciate it. I've known you since long before Tim Jordan killed himself, and I can say from my point of view, in the period following that, um, I, I'm treading lightly when I say it was a weird time for you, and you were kind of a different person for a period, maybe forever. But I'm trying to understand how suicide and this stuff impacts other people. So if you don't mind, tell us about it. Yeah, well, so that's tough. That's a really tough question, and this plays into a lot of what we were talking about. Tim would talk to me about stuff, but he wouldn't talk to a lot of people about it, you know? But as his friend, he would call me breaking down, crying, um, being really upset about something, whether it be with a girlfriend or uh, his music career or just a general, you know, mental meltdown, right? Um and honestly, it wore on me. Like, I didn't know how to deal with that type of intensity from somebody, even though he was my friend and I right. loved him. It it wore me down. Like, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to deal with it. So. No, I can totally understand that. I, I mean, uh, I have friends who suffer from severe depression and there are times where I don't know if I, I can handle it. Yeah. Because it, it that depression then starts affecting, like, my personality and how I treat them, what I, how mm-hmm. I'm reacting to them. And it still seems, though, like it didn't seem like it was going to come to that that much of a head. Right? Like, you, you did not really, think that you were going to get a yeah. call. You don't really think that. And me and him were both touring a lot. Like, As Cities Burn had just put out our uh, first record, so I was on the road practically every day of the rest of that year. Um, so there'd be times where, like, man, I feel so bad even talking about it. Like, I knew he was going through a really hard time. But then I was out on the road and doing all this stuff, so there'd be times where he'd call or something, and I'm, like, in the middle of hanging out or whatever, and I'm just like, ah, I just can't do it right now right mm-hmm. um and but, so but also don't you think that some of that comes from the lack of education the lack of talking about this and realizing oh, sure. in the moment yeah oh wait a minute the, here's here's some uh mm-hmm. here's some telltale signs that this might be more serious and so i need to do that like you were you, probably in your mind you were thinking oh here's my friend he's gonna call and complain or be sad about a girl or something yeah. right yeah you didn't think oh my gosh this is a dangerous situation no i didn't really know what depression was right i didn't like really i mean you've i've heard about it or whatever but i didn't understand that it was really a thing and i felt bad for him and what he was going through i mean he would be hysterical yeah you know finding finding something out about his girlfriend cheating on him or just really crazy intense and um i didn't know how to i just didn't know how to handle it and then it got to a point where i didn't want to handle it and so he had tried to call me and this is really awful um, and I feel really bad about it. Uh, he had tried to call me a couple times the day before he killed himself, mm-hmm. and I just didn't answer. Um, and uh, I never got to talk to him again. There's a lot of blame that I, I, I blame myself a little bit, but then if, as time goes on, I just realize like that could have gone on for who knows how long. Like, hey, call this person and keep going another another 24 hours and uh, hold, keep holding it together. But eventually, uh, I, I don't know what could have fixed it. So I don't I don't know. What do y'all think? No, that's, that's quite confusing, and you don't need to have it wrapped up or, or any answers there. I don't think it, they're possible to have, and nor do you need right. to. And I don't think this is that is the goal of what we're trying to say. Like, it, it's just better if we can at least get these stories out there. Yeah. Like, that is the thing that I think that nobody understands is I don't think we're going to cure mental illness, but what will be a huge help is if we understand that it is real and that people are going through something more than what than what we think because I had tons of friends who would call me hysterical at, you know because a girl broke up with them you know you have your teenage friends and it's that thing where everything means something mm-hmm. you know what I mean like you you're so emotional and especially if you're a musician or an artist you know your emotions are that much higher so it, it does seem like oh well he's just going through this that girl's a jerk yeah yeah Tim she's just a bad girl you know yeah. okay but it does there's no you didn't have any training or education that would have told you wait a minute this is more serious than just a broken heart. This is something that he's taking it to an extreme. Now, probably in retrospect, you might that you're more mature, you might be able to see that. But in the moment, 
it's just so hard to pick up that, oh, this person might not be here tomorrow. Yeah. Tim's suicide, I remember when it happened, and I know that it impacted you, although I didn't even understand the depth that it would even impact you and your mental health, and honestly, that of a bunch of people around, like even Tim's suicide had a, a ripple effect that I feel like there's at least three or four people that I know who are no not mentally as healthy since, it, you know, yeah, basically, yeah. and I can't really even talk about them because um, they're not in their own words on this podcast, but it, it, that seemed really clear to me. And for sure, to this day, it rem- remains one of the defining things about your personality and worldview includes Tim's suicide. That's obvious to me, at least. Yeah, it was a weird turning point. Um, I mean, I made a lot of bad decisions in the uh, months following Tim's death. I mean, you can't think clearly uh, when stuff like that is going on. Um, and so, yeah, it affected a lot of people, uh, uh a few people in, in bands, uh, that were close to Tim, um, are, you know, they're not the same anymore. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how other way to put it. It was devastating through and through. So yeah, it's still, I mean, it still affects me to this day in different ways. It's, it's a weird thing to talk about. So it, it even affected the label, Chad Johnson, who we did an episode about, uh, who is very pastoral, uh, and is kind of the guy that when things like this happen, he's the the face of tooth and nail and how to handle it. Chad talked about it in his interview. I don't remember thinking of Tim as like someone that that had a real like challenging issue in life, and then he's always dealing. I always thought, man, this guy's super. He's insanely good looking. He's well built. He's super gifted. And he always seems like happy and jovial and like a just an awesome guy to be around. And I definitely remember being completely shocked, like learning at the come and die retreat that Tim, as a as a tooth and nail member, had hung himself. What it was like the ominous gray cloud that you'd rather not deal with and you'd rather not really process because it just was that crazy and that heavy and that um, otherworldly. It's like, no way. I'm Jonathan Dunn, the bass player in Demon Hunter. Our song, Carry Me Down, from the album Storm the Gates of Hell, has a lot of personal meaning for me with a friend that uh, committed suicide when I was in high school. We get a lot of people saying that, you know, our music has saved their life or encouraged them or kept them from suicide or it's become a really uh, common thing, which is awesome and encouraging. And But I'm absolutely glad that, you know, our music can provide for people in that way and give them encouragement. I 
think that's the beauty of music is that um, it speaks to a lot of people's uh, personal situations, but they can apply it to specific things that they're going through. So even a lot of times like an artist might be thinking about love and somebody else can attribute that to, you know, loss or death in their life. You know, and that's a beautiful part of music is that it kind of goes beyond what an artist's original intention was and kind of takes a life of its own in the listener. What would have been helpful for you, for instance? Like, what what is the help? Here's Matt and Rob Schweitzer again. Like, talking it out with uh, with people that you trust, people that you are, that you love and, and that you trust. But here's the thing about that is sometimes you don't feel like you can divulge that kind of information to those people either because you don't want to appear weak to them or be judged by people who think that you're strong. And so then you keep... You keep this facade up in the interest of like being something that you're not. For me, I think I think what helped was was being able to talk it out with somebody who's a licensed professional, objective counselor. You know, and I'm able to like bring to the table issues that are bothering me and questions that I have without feeling any kind of uh, judgment or repercussions. And I see. It's an, it's an important thing because then once you get it all out, you you, you realize just how how important it is to, to, to be able to talk things out because your, your mental faculty, your mental constructs need to be, I mean, you, it's important to talk things out. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we give that enough credit. Well, that's interesting that you say that. It's like it's almost more useful to talk to somebody you don't know. I mean, of course, a professional is better. But the fact, but to deal with somebody that's a medium friend or even a close friend or spouse or family member, it's actually can even be more difficult because you have so much, you know, so much relationship that that can be a hindrance. Mm-hmm. For me, I am very far removed uh, physically from my family. We all get along just fine, but we're not close to the point where I feel where I felt comfortable in sharing what it was that I was mm-hmm. going through at the time. And and even now, they since uh, since that situation happened, the attempt. You know, my parents and my my sisters know about it now, and uh, I feel like I can talk to them a little bit. But it's not something that we 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 talk about on the regular. I go to a therapist uh, once a month or once every two months to to kind of air out whatever seems to be bothering me. Did they not know uh, when your suicide attempt happened? That how long until they had known knew that it happened? They did not know right away. No, I didn't. I didn't inform my family, my immediate family, my parents and my my two sisters about my suicide attempt. Um, I think I can't remember what it was for about a year and a half, maybe maybe two, um, because oh I just I just didn't want to be a burden to them. That's that's that's. Plain and simple, what was in my mind? It's like, why bother to tell them that? You know, it's just something else for them to worry about. So I'll just get the help that I need to get, and then not worry about like be- becoming a-, a burden. But you want to know what? It's like even prior to that. That's what it's. It's part of like it's part and parcel of like what you feel or what like kind of led to getting to that place. Um, like a few years ago, it's like that. You know, I've always felt like I was, and this is this is kind of vulnerable. Um, I've always felt like I was a burden. In, in a certain way. And so it just carried on over the years of just like bearing that, uh, uh, that kind of guilt, you know, it just, it just played right into, um, you know, post, post attempt. That's, that's, um, that's, I mean, to be honest, that's incredibly sad to hear. I'm sorry. Do you think, do you think somebody or something could have stopped you? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I, when you when you are on that path, there's not really much anything can anything anyone can do to stop you, you know. But but we have this suicide problem, right? In in society, and everybody's like me is going, wait a second, this is a problem. I don't want Chris Cornell to be gone. I don't want Rob to be gone. I mean, there's people that are, that are gone. I mean, we'd like for less people to be gone. And I'm and if I ask somebody that's been through it, is there anything we could have done? What would it have been? What could have, what could we do better for for people? I mean, we're glad you're here. But you could easily not be here. Could we have not helped? You know, I mean, you would think that there is something that other people can do for you, right? But we each walk our own our own path. And we each go our own journey. And it's like no matter how much we are surrounded by those who, who care about us and love us and have been inspirational in, in bringing, up, bringing us up as kids like our parents or teachers in high school and college or whatever, music mentors, uh, other friends who are in bands, musicians, uh, whatever, you know, it's like ultimately at the end of the day, it's, it's, uh, 
it's one's own decision what they do with their life. I think it's important to always be there for somebody. Like, and I, I don't, I opt to, to be honest, and this may not be like a, a popular answer, is like there's not really anything anybody can, can do to prevent that except for just being a friend to that person and being real. And, and being a part of these conver- having conversations with your friends and like when you ask somebody how they're doing and, and you know, that, that question is such a loaded question. Hey, yeah, how's it going? It's like, do you really want to know? Do you have, mm-hmm. do you have time to sit down and hear what I have to say? Because I'll let you know. But, you know, it's like, I, I don't know. I think it's an individual journey everybody has. It's, it's, there's, all you can do really is just try and go beneath the superficial with the people that are closest to you. Um, and just be be there for them. Maybe just take a little extra time to make sure that you give somebody the opportunity to talk if they're if they're willing to do or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's some in, there 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 may be indications that people give when they're not they're not feeling one hundred percent, you know. And it's important to kind of it's great to have a good time. It's great to joke around and uh, but at the same time to sit down and say, hey, you know, how how are you? And really mean it. Mm-hmm. Not like the passing five. If someone had asked you that, you would have told them. If somebody would have been more intentional about t- saying, "It looks like you're unhealthy to me. I don't know where you're at, but can can we talk about it?" You would have, or you would think you would have wanted to not be a burden and all that. The, the key word. Well, yes, you're right. I would not want to be a burden, but the, the key word that you just hit was intentional. Mm-hmm. Intentional about that question. In other words, you know, you respect the person's, you know, uh, you know, privacy, but at the same time, you're, you're like, you ask that question, and if you can sense that person is, you know, I could easily just look, look at you straight in the eyes and say, oh yeah, 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 they, they, things are great. But if you know me well enough, and your close friends will, you'll mm-hmm. say you can, you can stop and just say like, no, seriously, like, are you okay? And so that then, takes the burden off. Uh, burden is the key word, I suppose, there, because you don't want to be a burden. That's already something you're saying you're going through. So if I say, how's it going, Rob? And it. You know, you're not. You may wish to tell me, but don't. You're afraid that that would burden me. But if I sat down and looked at you and said, "Rob, I feel like something's going on with you," you don't have to talk about it. But if you want to, I want you to know. Is there anything going on? That then, then the burden's not on you to bring it up. I've brought it up, so that's a barrier that you think yeah, that would, would be say, helpful. I would say that's very accurate, and you would you, you'd be surprised uh, just how open the your your friend would be to to going ahead and and, abs- and and telling you the truth. And you wouldn't find it insulting to have, have had somebody come to you and go, "Look, I think some some weird stuff may be going on with you." <laughs> like, well, if you said it like that. Yeah, you know, yeah, well, uh, you know yeah. screw you, dude. Yeah, no. No, but I mean, it's like no. You would, you would, you would ask it sincerely and as a friend. And if you guys, if you're if you're close enough, you're gonna know. You're gonna know the be- You're gonna know the intent of your friend who really wants to know if you're doing well. Not not just trying to make you feel strange or weird. My name is Mark Solomon, and uh, I am writing about the song "Acquiesce" off of Stave Zaker's album "Absolutes." I wrote it in the middle of a six or seven month long downward spiral. What the song was at its core was a cry for help, you know? It was like my psalm, (laughs) you know, those psalms that David writes where he's in a cave and everybody wants to kill him. And I think it's worth saying that 20 years ago, depression as an actual clinical problem uh, was not really a consideration in the church, you know? You just weathered the storm and uh, There were plenty of moments where I thought I was just going to step off a building, just step on off, you know. Uh, Have people talked to me about that song? Absolutely. I've had more Facebook messages than I can remember where people have have named that very song as part of a a recovery process in their life. And that humbles me beyond what I can express here. I think music has that power because that's how God designed it. Sorry. Sorry. That's what I believe. Not sorry. That's what I believe. That's what he made it for. I believe he gave us song and music and melody to sort of fully realize our emotions. That's what it's for.
This episode is hard, but I want to share three things with you that I think need to be said right now. Number one is that when you are hurting, you're unable to see how much you mean to the people around you. You become so focused on yourself and your pain that you lose sight of how deeply you are loved. So go looking for how deeply you are loved. Number two, depression and suicidal thoughts are like an ominous wave of darkness. But if you're in the ocean on a sinking ship, what do you look for? More water? More ominous darkness? No, you look for a lifeboat. And that lifeboat is absolutely minuscule compared to the immense ocean, but it's the only thing that is going to save you. So look for the positivity in your life. Look for reasons to stay present and connected. Look for love, even if it seems insignificant compared to your pain or sorrow. It can literally save your life. And number three, the things that you feed will grow. Think of your depression like gremlins or something. Stop feeding the stupid things, and I promise you will feel differently about them. And I am in no way trying to trivialize or downplay depression. It is a serious thing, but I know firsthand what it's like to daydream about ending my own life. And until I stopped letting that script play out in my head over and over and over and feeding it over and over and over, it never went away. I had to stop feeding the negative thoughts. I had to stop validating them and giving them strength. I had to take away their power by taking away their fuel and energy, which in all honesty was simply just my attention and focus towards them. Refuse to feed the very thing that poisons you. Look for love and look for people like my husband, whose job is literally to walk through your hard times with you. You are not alone. You matter to a ton of people. And sometimes you don't think you matter because people around you don't know how to tell you that you matter. If you're experiencing a life-threatening emergency, please call 911. If you're in crisis and need help, you can text to the number 741741 from anywhere in the U.S. and you'll be connected to a trained crisis counselor. All of these crisis counselors are volunteers who are donating their time to help you. There are people out there, I promise. And before we end this episode, we want to mention John Bunch, another tooth and nail alumni from the band Further Seems Forever, who took his own life in January 2016. We didn't feel like the right people to share his story but we did want to acknowledge his life and his contribution to the tooth and nail legacy. Our hearts go out to the friends and family members who are affected by suicide and to those who are struggling. We hope that this episode can help take away some of the stigma around simply talking about mental illness and give the opportunity for those who need it to reach out for help. We took your body, turned to ash. Thanks again for listening to The Labeled Podcast. I'm Matt Carter, along with Toby Morrell and Aaron Lunsford. This show is produced and edited by Melanie Studley and mixed by Brett Baird. Special thanks to our assistant producers, Reva Hansen, Marshall Fremuth, and Tyson Paletti. And extra special thanks to Adam Scatula from Tooth & Nail for helping to develop the show. See you soon.